Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to say a big thank you to Marco for inviting me for such a wonderful occasion and to the magnificent place that it is here. Uh, so, and secondly, a lot of the previous speakers have apologized already. I want to just point out here that uh, we didn't vote this way, so there we go. Uh, thirdly, I want to say that um, my, uh, the first time I met Larry was actually when I was, um, I was out of a job. I was trying, working with John Barber at the time at London. I, my background was engineering. I had nothing to do with psychology at all, coming back and uh, working on a project with pilots, vision, etc., which funding got cut off. And I didn't have a job, and I said, you know, John, what am I going to do? He says, well, um, Larry might be able to help out in this and just give you a project to do, etc. And that was the beginning of it, and that was uh, 1990. So it's been uh, 26 years ago, so we've been. And everything I'm going to be showing today has been actually almost 95% of everything I'm showing today has been collaboration with Larry since then. So we work extensively on that. and. Uh, introduced me to the whole field of psychology, which I'm very, very grateful for. Now, um, apart from that, a number of people have been working in the lab, and, can, and, and I've shown some of my collaborators. I'll be showing some of the experiments that they've done and uh, try to mention them at the time as we go through. Now, what I would like to do is to tell you a little bit about information on the, uh, what happens to the information in the blind field. You have lots of introduction already into this topic, and thanks for uh, Carlo earlier, covering most of the background on these ones. Um, a little bit about characteristics of what remains in the visual, uh, of processing in there, um, and uh, what happens after systematic training. So I'm looking at clinical cases and trying to see whether we can do rehabilitation techniques and what, um, you know, things like that. And I want to spend a little bit of time on eye movement on these patients, of course. That's something that I think there's plenty of mileage still to us to, to expand on. Now, of course, the um, lesions that uh, we always talk about the back of the brain and the stride cortex and we all know that uh, it's inevitably any of the patients that have lesions in there the lesion is not going to be clear cut and it's going to be extending to uh, not just v1 but surrounding areas and it covers the white matter as well so therefore all the you know the effect is a lot more extensive than just the tiny lesion in the one one particular area it's quite rare most of the patients have posterior cerebral artery damage, therefore, with more extensive uh, lesions. Now, uh, this is something that we all, you know, see in all the textbooks saying that, okay, we have got hemianopia, therefore, these patients are, are blind in one part. The most important part, I think, in here, come back to the definition, what we call blindness in there. Because, um, of course, the way we do this, we use perimetry. And perimetry is that you go to the, you know, eye doctor, ophthalmologist, optician, whoever, and uh, you ask you to press a button every time you see a target. And the way we do it, we just press a button every time you see something. And if there are places that you don't press every time something is presented, then uh, we call those places to be blind, okay? And so for clinician, that's straightforward. So you get the data out and it says, okay, this person's got blindness. But as psychologists, we look at this with horror because we say, oh my goodness, so what would happen if you use a different target what happens if you change the size of target? What happens if you change it completely? Moving stimuli, different, all kinds of things, all could give different results. Indeed, we know that uh, Manfred Fowler's work for different kind of perimetry just shows that the same patient even, if you use different kind of things, you get a completely different pattern in those. So what happens to this? What do we call blindness is, is quite a very important uh, question itself, and indeed, is a statement of Larry in 1961 that Larry says one's results in measuring the limits of visual capacity depend very precisely on the method of measurement. One clinician's scotoma is another one's amblyopia. Of course, amblyopia means reduced vision going back. So, you know, this is a problem that we have. So, we, in clinical in practice, what we do is that we simplify it. So, what we would say is that this person doing particular kind of perimetry at the maximum amount of luminance for a given stimulus size they cannot see something, and therefore we call that area blind. Um, and we usually refer to gold standards in perimetry, but what I'm saying is that we have to take it with a pinch of salt in general when we, when we talk about areas of blindness. Um, but Larry, of course, spent a lot of time in, in, in going back even in the 50s to look at 
Uh, what happens in mammals and with, um, in different species, you wrote a review paper, or what would happen in different species when you have got uh, lesions of equivalent of striated cortex or you know, occipital cortex in this, uh, in, uh, or with homologue in different species? And one of the things that uh, he also mentioned in the paper by Mort Mishkin in 1958 is that if you look to see what you expect to see in monkeys, how much deficit you like to see in monkeys after the, if you look at the point by point representation of the field and what they, what they, what they would expect to see, and compare that to in real practice, you find that monkeys are actually not, uh, they only have transient deficits after lesions, and these transient deficits go away, and they're quite small. So there is a huge variability there. You know, not as bad as you would expect to see. And there's a paper in, 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 in this one here, 1961 paper, that he looks at studies uh, about 100, uh, from 1930 to 1960, and he summarizes about 130 papers there that people have worked in there. So it's ex quite extensive areas of work. But our results you know, in humans are always a bit different. And of course, uh, we know that Larry's work with patient DB in, in 1973 paper, it talks about uh, patient DB to be able to, if you look at, if you try to look at the eccentricities that uh, something is presented and correlate that with somewhere that patient is forced to just point, uh, there's a good correlation in the blind field. Uh, of course, you would get a very good correlation in the sighted field, but you also get a good one in the blind field, showing that he can do pointing. So there are residual visual capacities in the, in general that the patient can have. And then and it coined the term blind sight, which was associated with the lesions of genicular striate cortex. And then later on, we qualified by two kinds of it, type one and type two. Type one being when the patient has absolutely no acknowledged awareness. We just tell you I'm guessing altogether, nothing. Or type two, when we say that, they say, okay, there were, I feel something might be there, but I didn't see anything. There's some sort of gut feeling. So we uh, had pre previous speakers talked about different aspects of this, and we, uh, it's been studied extensively, and uh, Mark presented some fantastic neuroimaging data, and, and, and we had from Bear about, about this, and as well as uh, recent work with, um, uh, uh, with others on, on the topic. So we know that it's been done quite a lot, but the lesions, the, the performance in the blind field is usually, if you look through the, this in general, is about one log unit or 10 times worse than that of the sighted field. Uh, this work of Alan Cow is looking at uh, chromatic processing or wavelength sensitivity in the blind sight, looking at the orientation discrimination in blind sight compared to the sighted field, and uh, some of the work that uh, Larry and I did on looking at uh, pupil responses in the sighted field and blind field in, in patient. There's always about 0.6 to 1 log unit, and even the contrast sensitivity function in the sighted and blind field. The blind field is reduced by about, shapes are always similar uh, on all these functions, except that sensitivity is reduced by one log unit. Now, this is a very much of became an observation that uh, Larry and I did made uh, a long time ago in, in, in a lab with DB, and we were showing two kinds of stimuli here. One of them is the the one on, the, on your left-hand side here, this is a, a, what we call luminance-defined target, so it's just black and white lines here. And the one on the right-hand side, we can see they've got contrast-defined targets. So these are tiny little black and white dots, but the contrast changes across there, but total light levels don't change. So there is no variation in luminance, but there is variation in contrast. Um, we made an observation in, uh, that if you ask DB to detect these in a two-force choice, uh, we can change the spatial frequency of these as a range of spatial frequency. Detection of all of these is pretty good. He was perfectly in, in detecting these. But his reported awareness was different. Whenever you show something texture defined, he had no awareness whatsoever of it. He just, not, you know, he reported nothing. Whereas the awareness of the, he had awareness of the luminance defined ones. And we tried to look at it, tried to decipher to see what's going on. And here we can see that, for example, we changed the first order target to be in 2004 with this study. Uh, very, if you like, low contrasty compared to the high contrasty. The black lines are detections and the lighter ones are awareness. Perfectly aware of first order stimuli, nothing at all of the second order. Uh, we didn't believe this data. A year later, DB came to the lab. We did it again in 2005. You can see the same thing again. We did it in 2008. Again, we repeated everything, and, and you can see that. Uh, pattern over and over 
repeats, you can change these things so that it become a bit more uh, profi profound. For example, these are square wave rather than being um, uh, sine wave gratings, and again, the pattern remains all the time. Second order stimuli, he was perfectly well detected, but no awareness, conscious awareness at all. But we changed something there. We changed the dot size, making a bit these bits that resulted in the gratings, we made them a bit larger, and suddenly he was 100% aware of them all the time. So we did a systematic study of that, and we find that the small, medium, and large awareness builds up, but the detection remains high all the time. And so we try and figure out what is it about this target that the moment you change something in it, change the sizes, uh, he was becoming more and more aware of it. And we look at large number of things. We look at the contrast, uh, sorry, contours in the object of these, trying to find out whether it is an increased number of contours, is it an increased number of, uh, look at the Fourier domain of the target. And what we found out at the end, to cut the story short, is that when you start increasing these dot sizes, you were introducing luminance artifact. And the moment you produce in luminance artifact, so this is the same as first order stimuli. If you have the light luminance creeping in, in there, he was becoming aware of something happening. So it and whereas wasn't so for the second order stimuli. So the so detection of the luminance defined has been studied again, it was pioneered with John Barber and Larry of this. And, and in 1994, what they did was to show these kind of patterns in the blind field of GY. And uh, the task was to just detect, you know, in the two alternative force choice, which interval contains this tar target. And what they showed was that GY had this narrowly defined, if you like, nice to find peak cycle, one cycles per degree stimuli could be detected very well, but higher cycles per degree here, high spatial frequency and low spatial frequency could not be detected in the blind field. And so the range of things that could be detected was quite specific in the blind field of GY. And again, what they did was to, to do that, have a look at this data, but look at the two monkeys with ablated striped cortex, and do exactly, so you do exactly the same experiments you do in humans and, and at the same time you do in monkeys, same methodology, and obtain the curves, and also open pupil, uh, obtain pupil responses in both human and monkeys. And you find that the pattern was almost identical, all these things. Both in monkeys, ablated monkey, and in GY, they had peak sensitivity one cycles per degree, and uh, uh, with the pupil responses responding best at that. What we did later on, we, then, we tried to find out, we're talking about, you heard mostly today about DB and GY and TN. The question is that, well, we know hemianopia applies to um, uh, patients that you know, you know nearly a third of all the stroke cases are like that. So we're talking about thousands of patients. Can you look at a large number of patients and see what, what, what happens in those cases? So we look at one of the earlier studies where they look at uh, uh, 10 patients or so, and we show that some patients did have those kind of, uh, uh, if you like, narrowly tuned, but some patients had some sort of low pass filtering, here, this kind of patterns. But indeed, for all of these, peak sensitivity was one cycles per degree. Some patients didn't have any detection at all in the blind field, so there are those that they don't have any at all. Um, we then also looked at uh, temporal detection. Uh, you heard, um, so when Larry and John did this in 94, they found that the GY's peak sensitivity was between 5 to 20, 25 to 20 hertz. And if you look at the group of patients here, peak sensitivity is about 10 hertz. Um, you heard early on from Carlo that uh, SSVP uses, uh, they was using at 12 hertz. Again, 10, 12 hertz, this is peak sensitivity in blind sight. So it's not surprising that the information does get through. In indeed, if you go to the much lower or high frequencies, the information doesn't tend to get through. So um, we did a larger study uh, more recently and uh, tried to extend the finding, both looking at the pupil responses that Larry's always been interested in and, and uh, detection of these GABO patches in, in summarizing about 20 cases. Uh, and I can go to this slide, possibly a summary of all these cases, 20 cases. First of all, psychophysically, we find that in these patients, there we go, we have a peak sensitivity about one cycles per degree. And if you measure pupil responses again, you do get pupil responses at low spatial frequencies, but not high ones in these patients. Um, 
with this um, in the blind field, as I always said, you know, there's a 10 times worse you know, one log unit reduction compared to the equivalent place in the sighted field in these patients. Again, not all the patients have these. Uh, if you look at uh, a pattern like this, so psychophysically we can see who has blind sight, who doesn't. So we can all these patients have, these ones don't. Um, if you look at the pupil responses, these patients have pupil responses signal, then these don't. So what trying to say we can find evidence of blind sight in terms of detection, look at the spatial frequencies, um, detection, you can find it um, that you, you get it about 70% of the cases that we've been looking at. And it's um, sensitivity of pupil as measuring the presence or absence of blind sight is about 85%. So it's a pretty good way of uh, looking at that. Again, a series of exact experiments that we did together a few years ago it was to look at GY and find out what would happen if you detected a moving objects left and right. It was just reporting. And we knew that he always good in detecting direction of moving targets, but sometimes he was not aware of anything at all, but he was much aware of targets being uh, present. And we did a functional imaging study after that, trying to find that neural correlate of this, which I'm not going to talk about. But what I was going to say that observation we need a few years later. This is the time that GY was being tested in every lab in the world every weekend, and it's quite a well-traveled, I think, millions of air miles and everything else. Um, after about two-year period, we tested him again using exactly the setup we had, and we obtained this, this data here. A two-year period, you can see that these are awareness responses he had before, and these were afterwards, and discrimination data change. So having been stimulated so many times, by different labs every week. His performance was getting better and better. He was improving. So it made us to think, OK, what would happen? We know that these patients have specific spatial and temporal uh, processing in the blind field. What happens if we get these patients and stimulate them on a daily basis over and over uh, for a long period of time? Can we affect the performance? And if we do that, uh, I want to show you some of the patient data in here. So these people, these um, cases basically doing a 2 AFC task in the blind field uh, for the number of targets in the blind field at home. But you do test them before and after in the lab with control eye movements and everything else. But when you look at the data, I like to look at this one here, for example. Have a look. The, the dotted line is the contrast of the target. So it's got a high contrast target. And this line here is the detection ability. And the patient's chance level all the way through. So 40 sessions, something happens here. You can see that. There is variability in performance, gets better and better. After 80, 90 sessions here, almost perfect. So this one here, now we call this blind sight because there is no awareness. Awareness here is trial by trial recorded. It's a very little in here. So these patients develop blind sight if you keep doing it Or in, in this case. Um, this is another case here. You can see that uh, performance is chanced in the beginning, gets better. But it recovers very quickly, these patients. After about 20 sessions, we can reduce the contrast, and you can see that performance remains high. This pattern is the same. But have a look at this patient here. This patient is chance level for a long time, and a war, a reported awareness also builds up over a period of time. Till about three, this is three, four months later, in the 100 sessions of sitting at home doing this. And then suddenly, after hand session, you can reduce the lumen contrast, and the performance remain high. And at the end, after about a year of doing this, it's perf pretty good reports seeing and being aware of something happening there. So you know, it, 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 we can we can see that how performance changes over time. Now, we've done this then in the lab, showing that. Yes, detection changes, contrast detection changes, and if you do it a larger group of patients, again, you can find that uh, performance before and after, the range of frequencies improves, etc. cetera, and uh, uh, we've reported all this in the past. The question I said before was that, do, do all of these patients improve if you do this? And the answer is no. Some people here, look at this case here of patient DE. Um, this is 450 sessions, so over a three-year period, most, you know, more, if you think Monday to Friday, you cannot do this at home, especially continue to do it, and, and you can see that performance doesn't change at all. It's chance level all the way through. So some patients don't recover at all. And this can, particular case, lesions extended anteriorly towards LGN, 
And we know that from the recent animal studies that if LGN is involved, the probability of having blind sight reduces and also the recovery is reduced. So, um, how much time have I got? Okay, keep going. Right. Um, I want to say, but I was going to talk about, so this is all the cases we're talking about, like the previous experiments that Carlo explained. You ask a subject, you ask the patients to look at a point and uh, fixate. But we know in the real life that's not the case. Patients move their eyes around, and of course they, they're moving their eyes, they explore the environment, they get around, they, they, most patients are able to com com commute, go to work, and you know, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between somebody with um, just a hemianopia and uh, a normal observer if you just saw them in the street very easily. So, it would be interesting to spend some time actually looking at eye movement in these cases to see what the eye movements are like. And we know that after the lesion, if you measure the eye movements carefully in these cases, we know that saccade amplitudes into the blind field is, is greatly uh, reduced in these cases. And they have a lot larger number of fixations in, in general. Uh, there is a, some of patients have disorganized pattern of search. For example, this is something that uh, Joseph Zeal um, uh, reported before, and the top data is um, performance of the normal observers when they explore a scene, and they, they, you know, they can do different tasks, he's reported, they can do dot counting tasks, we can actually look at the scene and ask them to, uh, uh, to look for a particular thing. You can see very systematic those are, whereas if you look at these ones here, these, these two here are the page, some of the patients, and you can see the pattern is very different. The eye movements are all over the place a bit. But, but some patients are a bit more organized than the others. Um, and it's been reported, um, Joseph Zill reported, that if you actually do a visual search task and ask the patients to do a search task on a daily basis um, over and over, uh, you can improve the visual search times. So here is a case that uh, the, these two patients, they're looking for a particular dot, in this case, in the center here, they looking for a O, um, and there it is one here, and then they press the button every time they see it, you present this, some of them sighted field, sometimes in blind field, and you can do this on, on daily basis, and you can find that the search times improve after these kind of um, uh, tasks, you can do that for two, three weeks, and the scan path improves, and the number of fixations that they make improve, everything improves in these, in these cases, and indeed, we know that a summary of last time I looked into this, about 14 cases, 14 studies have been done, over 500 patients have been tested. And we know that if you do systematic visual search, these patients in general, their reaction times improve and it actually affects their, their activities of daily living. And we recently looked at the, uh, Joseph and I looked at the group of 20 of these cases and provided them with a systematic training program and again show that the reaction times, as you can see, improve in these cases, and the number of errors they make reduces, and they also report a lower disability rating um, after they've done the training. So we know that the visual search improves. The question is that, is that the only thing that is wrong in these people, or are they, or do these people, do these patients develop can they develop optimal search strategy themselves? Or what, would, or what is it that actually um, causes patients to have, if you like, suboptimum uh, eye movements? What's actually leading to that? To study this recently, we started to have a look at normal observers. So what happens to you have, if you get the normal observers and uh, give them blind field, but not physically, no, not actually lesion in the brain, but Given them an eye movement task, and you make a gaze contingent paradigm, when as they move their eyes around, you remove the objects from the screen, so they think that they have a blindness, and, and ask them to, to do different tasks, and measure the eye movements and see how they actually perform. So, with the paradigm I'm talking about is something like this. You can do, if you think, if you look at the pattern like this, look for a target, that's very easy. You can just see where the target is. Um, it's different, this is a parallel search, you're very good at it. And you can see that on the right hand, the serial search, you're not very good at this. 
So, um, whereas that's the target there. So that's harder to do. That's a serial search. So we give normal observers this kind of task to do. But what we could do is to um, remove the targets. For example, in the case of left hemianopia, if you want to simulate that, you remove this. So as the person moves the eye to the left, you show more targets, and you move it to the right, you remove all the targets so they cannot see. What would we expect the person to do if you, if you had, if you had this, this to a normal observer? The optimum paradigm you would expect is this. You say that if something for a parallel search, uh, for something to stick out, if you half of the field was missing, the optimum thing for you to do is to make a large saget into the blind field very quickly, because then you can see the entire thing in your periphery and you can see whether the target is there or not. However, if you are um, uh, doing a bit more difficult task, then what you could do is you, it's harder to, to do this, but you can still make a large saccade into the blind field and then do a, a laborious, a small um, search. But it, you know, it doesn't really matter whether you're right or left in this case, but you know, it is a harder task to do. What would, what would we expect normal observers to do when you have simulated hemianopia? And the data here, on the, these data is interesting here, both serial and parallel searches people go straight to the sighted field. So the first eye movement people make is actually not into the blind, not the optimum, that go to it and then see, observe. Actually, they move to the sighted field. Uh, so we've, um, can say that, okay, maybe it's just because they brought people in the lab and you just give them a task to do and of people are just making mistakes. What if patients, on the other hand, are blind all the time, and maybe they have more interactions? So we tell people to do this on a daily basis, let's say, bring them to the lab five times, you know, the whole week, and then give them incentive to get faster and faster. Tell them that every time we measure your reaction time and eye movements, and uh, the faster you get, we give you double your money. And there are students, so we just, you know, give them incentives that you, you got to get faster and faster. And by the end of the uh, Week, if you're getting faster and faster, you can get 50, 60 euros. You know, if you if you if you if you do this task well, so they have incentive to be fast. And when we do that again, and uh, we ask them to look for these kind of targets, and we give them hundreds of trials and uh, do this on daily basis, etc., we can test um, Monday to Friday. We can give them uh, another task as well. We can actually do a series of measurements before and a series of measurements afterwards. So, for example, if we give somebody the entire screen and ask them to find a target, uh, you find that you don't even have to move your eyes in these cases. People, 200 millisecond presentation, people are pretty good in detecting these targets very quickly. Um, a bit harder to do for these kind of things. So we do a range of measurements before and after. We do some object naming. So we show these targets for, let's say, four seconds. And afterwards, we ask them to report all the images they see. We want to see whether, if they do this kind of training, are they getting better in exploration? Are they able to see, name more objects in the surround? Does it transfer to the activity, other activities? Um, when you do all this, it's, it looks maybe look a bit complicated, but I can, this is the um, accuracy data. Just concentrate on this part in here. This is results for every single of subjects that's been done over five sessions, and the improvement you can see here that people are getting faster and faster week time after time. So people are improving, their reaction times are improving, their accuracy improving, their reaction times also improve. So people get better, better. And uh, however, if you look at what they do, where they look um, in the first session compared to the, after the end of all this training, they still don't develop a uh, efficient strategy, because if you look at percentage of the times that they look into the blind field here, what you would expect to see is that all these lines, if there was an um, optimum strategy, you would make a large saccade into your blind field, and, and then you work back. That means that all of these curves should really go down and do a negative to start with. But you can see that there is so much variability between people and not two of the people do exactly the same thing. So people do not, even for simulated hemianopia, do not develop an optimum search strategy. So that's what we know. So first of all, we know that not having an optimum strategy 
is caused by hemianopia. It may not be just the brain injury, underlying brain injury, that gives results in this. But that's the reason we need to give training, because in the absence of giving instruction, etc., not normal observers nor the patients develop um, optimum strategies. And uh, I'll, 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 and just a few more data to say people get better in object naming, etc. So there is something else in here, and that is so optimum strategy is one thing. Underlying lesion is uh, lesion that leads into random eye movement is another thing. But something else is also involved, and uh, I want to just very briefly show you some of this data. This is going back. In 1977, the Muller and Wurtz study, when they look at monkeys and try to show objects in the ablated monkey, so occipital ablation in monkey, and you show targets and you train the monkey to make a saccade to these things, so move eye movements to these ones. And he showed that uh, if you do that, train the monkey to make saccades, afterwards they quickly recover in places that you have, have uh, stimulated, they recover and they, they, they can detect objects there, which is a very interesting finding. Um, there is a concept there that I want to bring in, and that is the saccadic remapping. That means that if I have a target here, and I'm looking at this fixation, some receptive fields of, so imagine there is a cell we're measuring from, and it's got a receptive field here. If I, the task is to move from one point to another, when you move to here, this target falls in the receptive field of that cell. If you measure from the cells, we find that some cells respond way before an object falls into the receptive field. So before even the object appears, uh, we get an activation in them. And that's known in saccadic remapping, and there's an awful lot of stuff, uh, both electrophysiological and psychophysical studies done in that field. So what would happen in, in uh, normal observers, if I'm looking around, supposing there's a scene that you're exploring, looking at the eye movement in these, so you can move light, left, etc., different, explore the object uh, scene. But on the retina, this is what would happen. Everything swims from one place to another, so the retina image is a lot more complex, so it's, it's not stable, it will move. A hemianopic patient, on the other hand, when they look in the scene, it's a lot more complicated because as they look through the scene, the hemianopia moves along as well. So some of the objects falls within the blind field, some don't. So what I want to say is that what would happen if you have got, let's look at something like this. For example, if you're looking at this point here and you move to another point, that object falls into the blind field. So the patient no longer sees that object. And then when you move again from to another point, the object appears again. We're trying to see what would happen if you make eye movements and we bring something into the sighted field, for example. The information that was in your blind field, can it modulate your performance? Can it actually affect your performance? For example, we can move from one point to another and we can have a big prime. And then as you move your eyes, the moment you move your eyes, that point disappears. So when you get to this point, you no longer have that. And these are patients, for example, with the right hemianopia. So when you can look at the detection of this in a blind field and see how it's affected by this eye movement. And we find that if you make this kind of eye movements, although you're moving, removing them, the reported awareness in these cases improves. So people report seeing these a bit more. So something happens there is an effect of eye movement to information from the blind field that comes into the sighted field. We can explain that a bit more. We can have a look at the detection of a very, very faint target into the, in the sighted field. And we know that um, if you follow it, if you precede it by a prime, you are more likely to detect it compared to if you didn't have a prime. So if you show something and then you move your, bring it into the sighted field, you will, you will detect it even better. And in a series of experiments, we've shown that if you move your eyes, sensitivity in the blind field actually does change if you are expecting objects to come in. So to cut it all short and summarize the whole thing, we know that we can change the sensitivity in the blind field by repeated stimulation and also using eye movements 
as a possibility. We know that it can change the sensitivity in the blind field as well as moving, changing the dynamics of eye movement in these patients with repeated stimulation. Thank you. Thank you, Arash. Questions? Bob. Hi, Arash. Lovely talk. Um, one thing that worries me is the specificity of the changes in the dynamics of eye movements that you get. So certainly the stuff Suzanne Shute and Charlie and Sepp and I did with simulated hemianopia, uh, I don't know when it was, 10 years ago or something, um, we found that you know, one kind of training would facilitate reading, but wouldn't help with uh, exploring a visual scene or doing a search task. Different kind of training helps with exploring a visual scene, doesn't help with doing a search task. Do you, do you have any comments on, on that? I mean, I, I wasn't sure what training you yeah, used. Yeah, I think, I think there, are, there are different aspects to, to this one. For, for patients themselves, in, in, in patients, when you have got, um, if, if you measure the eye movements, at least majority of them have abnormal eye, eye movements, abnormal search patterns. So when you give them search tasks and then you measure it again, they, they improve, they do improve, and the reaction times get better. And now I think it's well established, we can say that you know, with hundreds of patients being tested, that there is an improvement in, in those cases. For Simulated hemianopia, I, I think the kind of task is important that you do, and it's always harder to always imagine that you, know, you only have these people only for a small number of hours in the lab, and you know, they go back revert to what they do. But that's the reason we brought in this kind of a range of things to measure. For example, have a look to see whether they can look at natural images and try to re report how many objects they can see and see today are they get better on, on, on those tasks. And we find that, yes, the reaction times improve, but I maybe didn't go through it very well, but we think that the improvement you get in normal observers is not much to do with the eye movement itself, because you just show the eye movements are all over the place. But what John Barber used to call search lobes, you know, you make better discrimination into something in the peripheral vision in these cases. And I think some of the data we got points towards that. So people just make better discrimination in the blind, in the index, index peripheral vision as, as they do more and more of these kind of tasks, uh, which, which is a bit slightly different a mechanism than that of the patients. But even for patients, um, so even for patients, it, for SEPs, hundreds, thousands of patients over the years, there are differences in the effect that reading-oriented training has on the patient's recovery in reading tasks and in exploration tasks. Uh, so you can, you can alter the eye movement strategy of, of patients so that you improve both, but you need both kinds of training. You, you need both kinds. I think the, the data on, um, on reading, it just shows there's a different kind of eye movements compared to that. And yes, I've seen the paper and also your collaboration and also other, uh, more recent Schultz papers showing that you, if you train one, it doesn't improve on the other one, etc. So reading is quite a difficult um, thing altogether. And also reading difficulty after brain injury, there are so many different causes for it. So we have to isolate exactly what patient, what kind of patient and what that. Yes, there is, there is that. But I'm not convinced yet about um, efficacy of a training task that you can combine the two together. I, I'm still not. I've seen some of the data that from Durham, but I, I don't think that's been published yet, no. Thank you, Arash.